All right, so the recorder's on, and it's just about a minute till the session. You might want to just ask people to give you a quick reality check, make sure they can see. Hi, Susan. Okay. <laughs> people hear us there. <laughs> I'm gonna exit now and push the start button, then you'll be live, okay? All right, so. All right have fun, we're here if you need us. Hi, Susan, Rachel. Hello. Oh, Rachel says happy birthday, Eric. Oh, well, great. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Eric Braunwart with Columbia Gem House. I'm Sabrina. Sabrina is with Dalian Toil. She's the designer that we work with. So we're going to talk a little bit about stones. A lot of the stones that we have, it's been a challenge figuring out how to show them here. So yes. um, Sabrina's come up with a rather interesting way of doing it, um, but we'll talk more just about what we do and then refer you to the um, store, the store, Jumbo the, the Gem Boutique online, actually. So, um, and just a quick note uh, to help Susan out uh, and to help us out. If anybody does see something they want to order, I'm going to give you a, a code. How about that? Uh, it's hashtag CRJC2020. And that'll make everyone's life a little easier. Yeah, so use that code if you're buying something, and we can make sure that it's um, contributed to the, uh, comp the conference. So just a little bit about Columbia Gem House for those of you that don't know it. Um, we started, well, I guess it's almost in the end of the year. At the end of this year, it'll be 45 years ago, and I started there. Um, and it, we started as gem wholesalers, but very early on went into cutting. And so we've had a cutting operation for, Ever? gosh, 40 years, I guess. Um, so... And in today's world, 98% of everything we sell, we actually, so we've worked with miners for a long time. Most are small artisanal miners, some are larger miners. Um, but just a little bit about how we got to where we're at on the table. We always felt that telling stories about the stones was a lot more interesting it added to the stone emotional value if you will but i did a uh, world bank project uh, in madagascar which would be 20 years ago now and the title of the project was uh, gemstone mining as a method for poverty alleviation so one of those big giant titles say that world, three times fast yeah that the world bank likes to come up with <laughs> And it was interesting because you had to look at things different, opposed to looking at how your actions benefited your company at home, which you still need to do. You needed to look at how your actions benefited the producers also. And so after I finished that project, that's when we came back and wrote our first um, quality control and fair trade network protocol. So those were written and published 20 years ago. Uh, so for people who don't know about them, if you were doing a new brochure with those, but um, anybody that wants to see them, let us know and we'll tell you where they're at on our website because right now I... You can go to the Fairtrade Gems website, I'm pretty sure has... Has the protocol. Has the, well, the principles, the protocols are how long? They're a lot. Uh, protocols like, are like 28 pages. 28 pages of protocols that probably... Um, should be published somewhere. Well, they were, <laughs> but we're switching websites, so they seem to have lost somewhere. So yeah. Um, but the reality is, is every decision we make now is based on those. So before we add a new rough supplier, we need to look at it and say, can we get them to a level that can support what we publish? So, um, and it's the same with cutting. You know, so many people think the supply chain is mining. Well, that's where it starts, but that's certainly not where it ends before those stones. Um, 
um, the cutting is critically important also. And I don't know. I, I often say I think there's a lot more problems at the cutting level than there is at the mining level. But 10 problems compared to eight problems, uh, it's many. So uh, we look at both cutting and mining so we know in both cases where it's done. Um, I'm going to talk about this for a second. Sure. So from that, <clears throat> the Fair Trade Gems principles, um, it's partly what's used, I think, to talk about the levels, right? Right. So um, supply chain transparency, environmental protection, mine restoration, safe working conditions, which is where the cutting falls, fair compensation, um, all of those are things that um, Palmia Gem House obviously thinks about while they're putting their um, codes together. Go ahead. Yeah. He's got a lot to say. It it does make it much more difficult when you're, we just worked on a project where they, a very large company and they had to have an outcut and they wanted it traceable. And I said, look, that's not a simple thing. So we spent uh, probably two months working because it all comes out of Congo, which is a challenge. Um, so we spent probably two months working a supply chain that we could actually document and show this company that we don't just say we do it, but we actually do it. And of course, by the time we got all that documented and ready to go, they said, oh, too late. We needed it for Christmas. Um, anyway, um, so it's not just somebody offers us a parcel of rough, what we call opportunity buys. You look at it, it's a great price. You say, oh boy, I can make a lot of money. I'll buy that. We don't ever buy that way unless we can document all the, the support things around it. So um, anyway, so what do we do? Where do we work? We, we actually work in many different places around the world, um, but Africa is one of the main ones. I went there the first time in 1982, uh, so a very long time ago. Um, I wasn't even born. <laughs> <laughs> so it was just as Kenya, even before, Tan or just as Kenya and Tanzania were opening up as, I think it was about 10 years after they found Tanzania. Um, so we worked with a lot of people then, a few of them we still work with today. Um, and, but we learned a lot about the area and how it was produced and traveled through much of that. So today we still work in, Tanzania and Kenya. Uh, we work in Nigeria quite a lot. And we work in Liberia. But also then down into Southern Africa, we we did a lot of work in Malawi for the last 20 years. And that's actually where we worked an agreement with one of the Ruby Mines where he helped support developing schools, the hospital, housing, pure water areas. Um, a lot of different things. So if you ever go there, there's little placards around the area that talk about us, but also some of the retailers that we worked with in the United States. So it was really a joint effort with the mine operators, uh, us, and then retailers that we worked with. We would actually set up programs where we would talk about, you know, what we were doing and the retailers could actually present that to them. And so they actually became part of part of the solution or direct. I'm not sure how, but there was no Malawi sapphire that ended up in the gem boutique. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, he pulled sort of the stones. Just yes. But um, so we're going to show you a couple of stones here and our little. We'll see how this works. Right. Um, but these are both Nigerian stones. One of them is in green barrel, and we're actually quite well known for that right now. So this is about a four and a half carat uh, green barrel from Nigeria. And these stones are colored with chrome. That's why we call them neon green barrels because they are a neon green blue overtone. Technically, you could probably get a 
lab report that would say emerald because it is beryl and it's colored with chrome but it's such a fantastic stone in its own right we don't we just didn't want to confuse it with emeralds so we actually we've actually had a lot of questions about why did they what you probably could call that emerald um but eric's old school i'm just kidding <laughs> old, yeah. old um yeah it's just not green enough right but it is such an electric color that it really should be a gem in its own way so uh another one we get tourmaline from the nigerian area and this is an eight and a half carat tablet cut rubellite um since we do all of our own cutting we we do come up with a wide variety of cuts that we can do one of a kind or as production cutting if somebody needs to do them you know more than you know a repeatable line so uh but rubellite uh, different colors of tourmaline green barrel ruby from the liberian area um, Abharasha from Malawi, untreated natural pub. Natural uh, Yes. And um, so there's a number of different African stones that are listed in the I so, Dana. I saw Dana, Kathy. Uh, we see you. Um, another one that we get a lot is uh, Morganites. And Morganite is a challenge in that. The vast majority of it is irradiated white barrel or irradiated Goshen turns of orange, which is okay if people tell you, but where we can do it with untreated stones, we prefer to. Um, the other concern is, is that Russia produces a huge amount of ink barrel synthetic, but nobody sells it. So it always makes you wonder where all of that goes, tons <laughs> of it. So we have a concern that that part of the Morganites on the mark. So we're very careful. Um, ours are not treated. So, um, well, we'll move on a little bit uh, to American stones. And American stones we've worked in for a long time, since I was maybe six. Didn't you guys um, have the first? American gemstone line or something? Yeah, we did. And that was a long time. And it's just because I, you know, we were rock hands and we were kids. We loved it. You're out in the West and part of your vacations were actually to go dig for geodes or fossils or whatever. So, and most people don't know, but there are a lot of gems from the United States. And it's somewhat easier to track them and, you right. know, trace them. And we have better environmental. Not better laws necessarily, but better enforcement. Um, one of the, um, you, you all probably have heard about sapphires from Montana, and we cut a lot of those. There's actually four different mining areas in Montana, very distinct, very separate. So we work in the Missouri River stones, we work in Gem Mountain stones. We cut a lot of Yogo Sapphire, and then we also cut some from a very different area. It's called dry cotton. Ooh. And that's my favorite because they have all the, a lot of bicolor stones that come out of that. Uh, bicolors and golds and oranges, some really nice stones. Um, Diana wants to know what stones um, come from the U.S. What stones come from? How the many? US? How much time do you have? Yeah, <laughs> I'll just I'll just name a few because I did write down some. But we get amethyst from Montana and from Arizona, smoky quartz from the California Nevada border, Colorado, and Montana, rose quartz from South Dakota. We get garnet, red garnet from Idaho, sapphires from Montana, ruby from the Rodeo Queen mine in Wyoming, which is the only ruby mine in the United States or in North America. Um, and then we get a lot of peridot and what we call antimogard. And those come from Native American reservations. The peridot, much of the peridot in the world that you will see are actually mined by the Apache Indians on the San Carlos and Yucatan. And then the vast majority of all of the chrome pyrotes, which are red, red garnets, come from the Navajo Indian reservation. And just as an aside, um, for all of you that don't know, 
we're in a COVID epidemic. Uh, <laughs> you might have figured this that out did. by now. Um, but the hardest hit area in the United States is the Navajo Indian Reservoir, and it's really bad there. So over the summer months, we did fundraisers where we donated a relatively significant part of all of our sales in uh, Antio Garnet for medical supply in the Navajo. So, um, Anyway, it's a very interesting story. I can't go into the whole thing on how it's mined, but we work with traditional Navajos. They can't dig holes in the earth. That would be against the religion. So they actually just, it's a long one year process, but they rake the desert and then they crawl around on their hands and knees and collect the pebbles. So we have a whole write up on it. Um, and it's, it's really quite interesting. What about tourmaline from California, which I never knew was a thing? <clears throat> yeah, we do quite a bit in tourmaline. Um, most of it is from California that we get. Uh, and there were huge tourmaline mines in California for many years. And matter of fact, if you go to China, either Taiwan or mainland China, and you see all the little carvings of pink tourmaline in the national collection, almost 100% is from the Stuart Litham mine. Uh, or the Himalaya mine in Southern California. Um, the last empress loved that color of pink, and so she bought everything for all of them. So, there is still some production in that area, and so we that's where our terminal is. There is some in Maine, but it's not something that we've been able to get enough volume. We have one more question, um, or I guess not one more, but I also want to mention that Amazonite does not come from the Amazon. <laughs> Um, I also just learned that. It sounds pretty silly, but we do have some of that also in in Virginia. Uh, Virginia. Yeah. And it's actually a mine that, that Tiffany's worked and uh, supported for many years around the turn of the century. So Dana asks, Eric, would you normally provide the info like the Navajo connection when shipping the stone so that they can share stories? Sure. And we also encourage you to not only share those stories, but when we if there are things we work with people like you so that you can talk to your customers that they can actually be part of um, fundraiser, whatever we want to call it, to help solve problems. I think it helps connect your clients to the issues and also the yeah, and sometimes um, stories are developing or um, things get busy. So if there's ever a time that you really want to have the story behind um, Eric, they have them. We're doing, trying to do a better job of getting them all together to make it easier to send out. But please just ask so we can make sure to get that information from you. Um, Catherine wants to know where the stones are cut. We cut stones. We cut some in the United States. Those would be the bigger, more important stones we would cut here. And then the bulk of the, from Millie to, I don't know, medium sized stones are cut at a facility we set up in China, oh gosh, 25 years ago or more. When we actually set it up, we were the second fasting company to set up in China. And I, as an American, couldn't even go into China at the time. I'd have to meet. Chinese partners on the border and we trade stuff back and forth. And then I'd sit there and drink beer for the next two days <laughs> until they came back and said, okay, we can't do this or this. So it's Such been a, a rough life. Yes. A rough life. And a long journey, but it's the same partners that we started working with 25, 30 years ago. I have another uh, question, Eric, if you want to take some, field some questions. Sure. Um, hello, Eric and Sabrina, I have a question for you. What have you found is the biggest challenge when sourcing ethical stones from abroad? Um, how do you find ethical sources overseas? This is from Michelle. Michelle, that's, that's a real good question. Uh, first, when we talk about sourcing stones, we source rough, which means we're working with the miners to actually by materials that we then cut. Um, and you it's a process. You have to start and you have to explain what you really want to see and how you'd like to get there and, and see if you can get buy-in from them. Most of them are very interested in being part of it. It benefits them. But if they're not, they, they're just not a supplier for us. Um, I guess our most involved one was 
uh, the lapis that we get out of Chile was an incredibly difficult supply chain, but we had a couple of companies that had asked if we could find other sources for lapis. We knew it came from Chile. And that took us almost two years to be, to be able to develop that supply chain. So you don't just go find them, you actually develop them. Source country. Um, we do have some lapis in the gem boutique. There is at yes. least one piece. Um, yeah. It's the Chilean lapis. A lot of people, I think, have a problem with Afghanistani lapis. Right. Um, so that's your point, yeah. right? We hope Afghan, yes, it is the point. We, we hope Afghanistan is going to get better in the transition coming up, but I, I question that. But we mined and worked with people in Afghanistan 20 years before even the Russians. So we've worked there for a long time and it is a challenge the last 20 plus years. Which is a really good point actually to bring up because Eric has a ton of stones. Like um, I actually just asked him the other day if he sits in his office and pretends like he's like Scrooge McDuck <laughs> because he has so many amazing things. Um, but some of the stuff we call heritage stones, which would have been prior to when you set up your pro your fair yeah. trade protocols. Um, and at that time, there was nothing major or maybe not not the crazy that had happened. So as things continue, you actually pull out of where you're sourcing things so that you're not supporting any um, rogue. Right. But those are things we tell you. Um, you right. Know, uh, yeah. we're, we don't know everything about every stone that we sell. We sell 150 different varieties, um, but we tell you everything we know about them, which is a lot, and that's on every variety. Um, so there are none that we will just say, we know it's uh, Chris a Barrel, and past that we don't know. Uh, we know the cutting, we know the origin. Some of the older ones, we may not have the export documents, and that's what, those would be the heritage. Just really quick, Eric. Sorry to keep interrupting yeah. you. Um, here's my shirt. Uh, uh, we have somebody asking about this. Susan was able to answer. Um, we do have these, or Susan still does, Wheeler. This, this is the Chicago Responsible Jewelry Conference shirt from last year. Um, you can buy these along with another shirt um, to support the conference and what um, they're doing. I like um, I like gems and blingy shirts, so this is the one I picked. Um, thanks for asking. <laughs> Um, we have one more question though about shipping i missed so let me grab that too it says um sorry about that um i don't know if i can answer this but hi anna um this says can you please tell us about the logistics of sending the gems across continents i'm assuming you're talking about um rough um, we're gonna go with that yeah in our case it's both because we ship, we sell internationally as well as sell domestically. But uh, in rough, we actually ship around the world, whether it's mined here or whether it's from other locations. Um, we document all that so we actually can show that it, let's say it came from Brian Cook, who we've just mentioned here, his regulated courts from South America, it would come to the United States. We would, he would document that for us. We would then show if it's being cut overseas, the documentation that it goes to China, and then the shipping documentation that it goes back, and what and that number will follow it all the way through the supply chain. We try and consolidate shipments as much as possible because, like, we do have an agent in in uh, the UK, uh, Kathy Chapel. We have another one. Sweden. She's on. Hi, Kathy. Uh, Andrea, who is really great. And so we try and consolidate shipments to those people instead of shipping 10 parcels to the UK and using more resources, we try and do it in, in parcel. We're getting close to time. So let me ask this one more question. This is actually a really important question, Catherine. So thanks for bringing it up. Um, this says, so all of your beads go through the same level of scrutiny when ensuring ethics and sustainability. I'm assuming you cut them yourselves too. The answer is yes. And beads are the biggest challenge. Beads and, well, beads are the biggest challenge. Um, without going into where they're cut, most of the beads are not cut under good conditions. The worst silicosis in the world is or lack thereof facilities. 
And because what people don't know, you start cutting beads, your rule of thumb is 5% of the raw material ends up as a bead. But what does the other 95% do? About half of it is scraps and pieces of rough. The other half is dust. And it's really, can be really bad. You see some of the locations where you have the little kids walking around in dust in the villages where the dust is up to their knees. So silicosis is a real problem and beans is where it's the problem. So you guys, if you follow on Instagram at all, you see us talking about silicosis a lot. Something that Columbia Gem House has really been adamantly um, trying to advocate for. They've done a lot of work in their own putting facility to make sure that's not um, uh, an issue, Yeah. which would be... Yeah, we're actually <clears throat> the poster child factory for China. Poster also, child. <laughs> because we and our partners there developed a very unique way of um, air filtration system so that dust levels are incredible. Um, just a little bit, Sabrina will show you a couple of other stones here. Sapphire is one thing that we do a lot of. So we talked about American Sapphire. Here's she can one. show you this. This is a uh, two carat emerald cut green or blue green Montana Sapphire. Do you know which one this comes from? This is some Missouri River stone. Yeah. Um, so we do a lot of Sapphire from there. We also cut Australian Sapphire. What's this? Uh, this one is Missouri River also, and this is in the geo cut that we're that we are developed uh, maybe 18 months ago, and it's been really popular. We really can like you tell it. I had coffee by the time I videoed that yeah, one. <laughs> yeah. Um. So yeah, I'll have her. This is just another American stone. We'll pop it up real quick. Uh, this is some of the turquoise that we cut. Uh, we do different locations. We do Sleeping Beauty, but that mine is currently closed. Uh, we're doing a lot of Kingman and then just some of the Kirik Lake and some locations for turquoise. Uh, and that is one of the tablet tests that we do that's also been very popular. So we do them as hexagons, but we do tablet cuts and other. Um, we have one more stone. I'm going to show it because okay. we're going to get out of time here pretty yes. soon. Um, this is a pretty, oh, difficulties, hold on. So this is a pretty um, popular stone for Columbia Gem House also because the Sunstone Schiller is so beautiful, if you can see it in our. Uh, so yeah, we, we cut a lot of Sunstone that is predominantly from Oregon. Uh, and they have three different mining areas in Oregon, again, which most people don't know. Um, and they're very distinct mining areas, and they produce distinctly different kinds of chiller in the stones. But this happens to be from the sort of central quarry mining area. So, but um, on sapphire, um, that is a big thing that we do, and we do it from milli, I hate to say it, but as small as 1.3 millimeter rounds <laughs> uh, up. And we it's almost do, like he cut him himself. <laughs> uh, yeah. We cut a lot of those, tens of thousands of milli in, in a wide variety of colors. So, um, and that's an important part of our business because it is hard to find. And I don't know, we have a few hundred so thousand much. of them. Yeah. Um, but we do Australian material. We do Malawian material. We do material from the United States, from various different mines. And we we still cut a little bit of Sri Lankan material, and we just finished quite a bit of Umba material out of East. So in sapphire, we cut a lot, and sort of every color that you can think of, and all sorts of different things that you don't normally see in sapphire, of which geo cuts and tablets have been very. Popular. This one says, "Love how much the geo cut resembles the logo for the conference from Jay." Uh, yes, one of us knocked off one of the other. Ones, so, <laughs> oh! But yes, it, it's very similar so style of cutting, which is good. Well, I think we are just out of time. So we thank you for your time. Yeah, definitely. We have so much to say, so hopefully we'll get to see you guys again soon. So great. Thank you. Yep. Michelle says, thank you for the work you're doing in sustainable businesses. It's very inspiring. Thanks, Michelle. Yep. Have a good day, you guys. Okay. Take care. Bye. Use the code. Yeah.